Could it be that the mystical island of Atlantis tells us everything we need to know about the ancient kingdom? This is a topic I've wanted to discuss for a while and I can't believe it's taken me this long to get around to it because this is huge. One of the greatest lore drops from Egghead Island was the revelation that the One Piece world is only a fraction of what it used to be. Whereas today, islands scatter across the seas separated by vast expanses of water. Nine 100 years ago, prior to the Void Century, there were many continents that we today know nothing about. The islands that exist currently are just fragments of the only one continent that survived. The rest of these mysterious continents? They've all sunk. And as part of Vegapunk's broadcast to the world, he revealed his hypothesis that the use of the ancient weapons during the War of the Void Century is what resulted in these catastrophic ecological consequences, namely, the majority of the world sinking underwater. And as soon as this was revealed in chapter 1115, my brain went ding 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 ding. Oda in some way must have been inspired by the legendary island of Atlantis. But for some unknown reason, it's taken me some time to research just how much Oda may have read into this legendary tale. Maybe that's because of my ignorance. All I could really remember about Atlantis was that it had something to do with an advanced underwater civilization. And that, that was based off my vague recollection of the Disney animated film, Atlantis, The Lost Empire. And back then, I thought, well, we already have an underwater civilization in the form of fishmen, so maybe Atlas won't be that super novel or super relevant after all. But, well, since then, I have done some proper research, and let me tell you, I could not have been more wrong. Atlantis, as in the original account and not the Disney version, is not a story about an underwater civilization. And Atlantis, I think, is actually super relevant to the mysteries surrounding the ancient kingdom. So for those of you who are not aware, Atlantis is the name of a mysterious island, most likely a fictional island that seems to have been created by the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. And what I mean by that is that throughout history, there have been some differing beliefs as to whether the existence of a so-called legendary superior kingdom really existed or not. It seems that the widespread belief of most historians is that Atlantis is a made-up island created by Plato to serve a metaphorical purpose. But there are those who do believe or have believed the island to have really existed, and then based on their belief, there have also been some really interesting speculations about the connections between Atlantis to other ancient legendary civilizations, real civilizations. And the reason why I bring this up is because both these beliefs, both approaches to Atlantis, actually seem to be super relevant to One Piece. So the first record of Atlantis comes from Plato. The Greek philosopher uses this legendary, supposedly made-up island as an allegory to discuss the hubris of great kingdoms as a part of a larger, greater philosophical deliberation of what makes a good state and what makes a perfect society. And according to Plato, Atlantis was an ancient naval empire that ruled almost all western parts of the then known world. Its society was incredibly advanced with a constitution or a structure wherein its rulers were the wisest, most virtuous and selfless people in society. A sort of philosopher kings, if you will. And these kings lived simply and communally to avoid corruption. And funnily enough, this is also the constitution that Plato encourages in what is his perhaps most notable work, the Republic. And that fact has been cited by historians to suggest that Atlantis is indeed made up and it indeed serves as a metaphorical utopia. So Plato also says that Atlantis was favoured by the god Poseidon and it continued to expand. However, this expansion would eventually be the kingdom's downfall. Because as the Atlanteans grew more and more powerful, their ethics declined. They became prideful, less virtuous. And eventually, Athens and its various allies defeated the Atlanteans. And worse still, this great kingdom, this nation, was the subject of divine punishment. The island being struck down by earthquakes and floods, sinking into a muddy sea. And I don't know about you, but as soon as I came across that detail, I immediately 
immediately started making connections to One Piece. And in particular, connections to what we currently know of the Ancient Kingdom. We know that the Ancient Kingdom was an incredibly advanced civilization with technologies light years ahead of what is possible today. We also know that the Ancient Kingdom was the enemy of and was eventually defeated by an alliance of various other kingdoms. The 20 kingdoms that would later go on to form the world government. The Ancient Kingdom itself disappearing with all traces of its knowledge and existence becoming lost to the rest of the world. And I have to say that this very much tracks with Plato's account of Atlantis. And in his story, the figures listening to the story of Atlantis had never heard of this legendary kingdom before. And he explains that's because Atlantis existed 9,000 years ago. And that to me seems to be quite coincidentally similar to the fact that the ancient kingdom existed at least 900 years ago. Also, because we know that Joy Boy is of the ancient kingdom, the fact that Poseidon, one of the three ancient weapons, was once his ally seems very much like how Atlantis was favored by and protected by the Greek deity, also named Poseidon. And if we dig deeper into the authorial intent of Plato, it seems like we can even make a connection between how these two legendary kingdoms came to meet their downfall. But before we get into that, a quick reminder to please subscribe if you haven't already, help me get to 100k subscribers, and I promise you I will stop interrupting our discussions with these sort of pleas and requests. So like I said earlier, scholars widely agree that Plato was using Atlantis as a metaphor, a metaphor to warn his then contemporaries against hubris. Interestingly though, throughout Plato's tale, Atlantis takes on the role of both what an ideal state ought to be, as well as what it ought not to be. Plato sets it up as this almost utopia before he plunges it down to the bottom of the earth or to the bottom of the seas, a cautionary tale of what a city, of what a city-state ought not to be. And it has been commented by historians, by scholars, that in his creation of this fantastically advanced society, Plato seems to have been inspired by a number of different societies that he himself encountered or he learned about. Cities like his home state Athens, but also Sparta or Persia. It's as if Plato has taken bits and pieces, specific elements from various societies that he deems as being good, he deems as being ideal, and he's merged them together to create his own idea of an ideal city or an ideal city-state. For example, Atlantis was supposedly a mecca of trade, and that seems to take inspiration from Sparta. Its canals, which seems to be a prominent feature of its architecture, are like those that were found in Mesopotamia or Babylonian society. Whereas the elephants and the spices that are talked about, that seems to be reminiscent of Persia. And in this way, Atlantis is like a political literary conceit. It's an extended metaphor of what an idealized perfect society should look like. But as Plato develops on this idea, he also writes about the great kingdom's downfall, and in this way, he warns against such hubristic advancement that results in people letting go of their virtues and their morals. And what I find really interesting about this is that this seems like what may have happened to the ancient kingdom. Something I found really interesting was Vegapunk's neutrality towards Joy Boy and the Ancient Kingdom versus the world government. Despite the fact that he knows of all the horrors that the world government have done, such as against his friend Kuma, or keeping the world devoid of the truth, or locking up real, true scientific knowledge, Vegapunk has still claimed multiple times that he doesn't feel like he can judge who is right or wrong when it comes to this great war between the Ancient Kingdom and the Twenty Kingdoms. And this for me has always been a clear indicator that the war and the constitution of the Ancient Kingdom, that will be a lot more complex than we realize. Which makes sense because this is One Piece after all. Rarely do we have anything that's so clear cut, so black or white. Every character, every story is very deeply steeped in nuance 
which is also just how I like it. But having read or listened to this story of Plato's Atlantis, it seems to me that Oda will likely incorporate this idea of the ancient kingdom advancing too much, advancing too fast, becoming too prideful for its own good, and the kingdom's downfall being the result, being the consequences of its own greatness. And this is actually something I have discussed in the past. I've had many ideas as to what exactly would have made the 20 kingdoms snap, what made it break. And one idea that I have discussed before, which I think may be particularly relevant, that goes back to the ancient kingdom's development of the devil fruit. So according to Vegapunk's hypothesis, all devil fruits are man-made because all devil fruits are manifestations of potential developments of humankind. And if Vegapunk's theory is right, and let's be honest, even if he isn't 100% correct, he must at least be on the right track because otherwise why else would Oda introduce this idea in Vegapunk's dialogue? So in that case, it's possible that in creating the devil fruits and therefore enforcing human development, the ancient kingdom incurred the wrath of mother nature herself. Especially if the creation of the devil fruits required lots of concentrated energy and this use of so much energy was having a negative impact on the universe. You know, even in spite of a limitless energy source like the mother flame. Meanwhile, the ancient kingdom's neighbors, they were growing more and more antsy. You know, as the ancient kingdom amassed more and more power and its citizens continued to develop more and more unique abilities. This is what sparked the war between the ancient kingdom and the 20 kingdoms. And what's even more, the forces of mother nature, the forces of the earth itself sided with those of the 20 kingdoms and sided against the ancient kingdom. Which I'm sure as you could tell is very similar to this idea of Atlantis incurring the wrath of the gods and being subject to divine punishment. And this might also make sense in the context of One Piece because then how else would the ancient kingdom with all of their super high tech as well as the devil fruits of its citizens and Joy Boy, Gear 5th Nika, how else could they be defeated? But then what becomes even more interesting is if you start taking into account the other stories, the other theories that have developed about Atlantis over the centuries. So like I said earlier, there are people who actually believe that Atlantis wasn't merely fiction. They believe that this mysterious legendary island really existed. And this belief has then developed into other various illustrious theories. And the one that really caught my attention was the Antidevulian world theory as per Ignatius L. Donnelly. So Donnelly was a populist politician from Minnesota in the US and in 1882 he wrote what has since been deemed as a pseudo-archaeological book titled Atlantis, the Antidevulian World. And though many historians disagree with him, Donnelly argues that Atlantis was real and it was the first region where humankind rose from barbarism to civilization. And according to Donnelly, over time and more specifically during the Antidevulian period, which is the period that's chronicled in the biblical book of Genesis, covering the time period between the fall of humankind to the Great Flood. And he says that during this period, the Atlantean civilization spread throughout the world and all the great ancient civilizations like the Egyptians, the Greek, Phoenicians, Hindus, so on and so forth, they are all descendants of this incredible pre-ancient Atlantean society. Donnelly even argues that the deities of the other various ancient religions like the Greek or Scandinavian mythologies, that they're all simply kings or queens or the heroes of Atlantis, and the stories that have been attributed to the various gods or goddesses are actually just a confused recollection of real historical events. And Donnelly's theory, although again, is not widely accepted by the broader academic historical community, his ideas have inspired others to develop similar trains of thought. Perhaps most well known might be Graham Hancock. And Graham Hancock has written international bestsellers, The Fingerprints of the Gods, as well as Magicians of the Gods. And he's also presented his ideas in a popular Netflix series called Ancient Apocalypse. Hancock argues in a similar vein to Donnelly, and he says that there once was an incredibly advanced civilization that possessed spiritual technology, and this civilization existed until the last ice age before they were destroyed by comets around 12,000 years ago. And according to Hancock, there were some survivors of this ecological disaster and these survivors
hunter-gatherers went on to pass on their knowledge to other primitive hunter-gatherer societies around the world. And this is how the earliest known civilizations, ancient Egypt, Sumeria, and Mesoamerica, that's how these societies developed. And he uses various examples like the pyramids, where various civilizations of antiquity like Egypt and Maya, they both have pyramids. And this is supposedly evidence that these societies share a common ancestor. And now I have to say that there are a lot of issues with both Donnelly and Hancock's works. I want to make clear that I do not subscribe to them personally, in particular because their theories have very racist implications. Because of their general conception that the Atlanteans were white, their theories imply that other cultures, and in particular indigenous societies, they couldn't have been developed enough, they couldn't have been sophisticated enough to create these beautiful structures, create these great architecture or structures of society. You know, such achievements would only be possible with the help, with the influence of the white man, of the white magician. And this is exactly the sort of belief that Nazis used to justify their propaganda of the Aryans as being the superior race. And in fact, there were high-ranking Nazis who were heavily, heavily also into the Atlantean mystery. So again, I want to make super clear that I do not believe this. Also, on top of the racist implications, I want to say that as entertaining as some of these theories may be, I do think it's very dangerous to present theories as histories or theories as truth which ironically applies as much to One Piece theories and speculations, which you all know that I do like to dabble in myself. But obviously, it becomes even more dangerous when it comes to real life. That being said, what I find very intriguing and what I find very interesting when it comes to One Piece is if Oda has doubled down and also took inspiration from the more modern day theories that have come about associated with Atlantis. And in that way, this could actually be apparent in his portrayal of the various kingdoms that are allied to Joy Boy and allied to the ancient kingdom. You know, like the Shandorians, like the Fishmen, Arabasta, Wano, the Mink, so on and so forth. I mean, after all, we can't forget another very important part of Vegapunk's message because Vegapunk especially noted the brutal treatment that those of non-human races, non-human species have experienced throughout One Piece history. And that has suggested that this is going to be a more significant story thread in the chapters in the arcs to come. And we can't ignore that these other kingdoms have seemingly been very much influenced by real societies, by real civilizations of our own world. For example, Arabasta seems to be heavily influenced by Egypt. Giants of Elba very much reflect Viking Scandinavian culture. You know, the Shandorians resemble the ancient Mayan civilization and you know, so on and so forth. So I can't help but feel that Oda must at least be aware of the theories that surround Atlantis and that it's even possible, perhaps even likely, that he has incorporated some of it into his own work. At the end of the day, both Donnelly and Hancock and their ideas, for better or for worse, are very popular, very well known. And if Oda has researched Atlantis to some greater depth, to a greater level of depth, which I do think he has, then I also think it would be almost impossible that he hasn't come across the these other works hasn't come across these more modern theories that have come about from or associated with Atlantis. And that's obviously not to claim that Oda believes in these pseudo-historical theories. Oda, like Plato, picks and chooses what he likes. He takes elements from various sources and he uses all of the various bits and bobs to deepen his own series for his own purpose. We've known that already. We know that he does draw from multiple, multiple works. So in this case, what I would like to see, and this is just me inserting my own values here, is if Oda could subvert the racist implications that are associated with these modern day theories and he could subvert these racist implications or racist tendencies through his revelations on what the real connection between the ancient kingdom and the other civilizations, the other species, what that comes down to. I mean, Oda has clearly tackled difficult topics like racial discrimination in the past and he's obviously continuing to do so or at least he strives to do so. You know, why else point out the discrimination that Buccaneers faced during Kuma's flashback? Why have Vegapunk specifically commented 
comment on it so recently in the Egghead Island arc. And Oda is, of course, no politician and is not a philosopher per se. And sure, he won't be able to solve all of these issues or even provide the perfect allegory to present these issues. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's not his job to do so. And personally, I've always felt that you can really see what his intentions are. And you can generally see that he comes from a good place. So if anything, Oda would be taking both Plato's idea in contemplating what a perfect society looks like, showing us both the positives and negatives of the ancient kingdom, telling us that hubris, too much pride, is not good, as well as showing us the dangers of living in an almost totalitarian, super controlling state like the world government, but then simultaneously commenting on the racial tensions that exist. Racial discrimination and race-based issues that exist in our real life and using his depiction of Joy Boy's allies to further share his philosophy on how we should behave and function as a society. But I think I've gone on a bit of a tangent there so let's take a step back and let's get less political, less philosophical. If it really is the case that Oda has been influenced not only from Plato's original conception of Atlantis but also the later theories concerning these ancient civilizations and its legacy, then I think this also raises further intriguing questions as to what we might see in the future. For example, one of the key claims from Graham Hancock is that the technology that was possessed by the great ancient civilization was a sort of spiritual technology. And this spiritual technology was, quote, enhanced and focused power of human consciousness to channel energies and manipulate matter. And I'm not gonna lie, that sounds an awful lot like Haki to me. I mean, is that just me? Could this really be the origin of Haki? I guess that could even be linked or tied back to the manifestation of devil fruits that I was talking about. The ancient kingdom enhanced and they focused their power. They focused all of their spiritual energy. They literally manipulated matter to create devil fruits, to create manifestations of what their imaginations on potential human possibilities. And if we keep going, in addition to this spiritual force, Hancock has also talked about psychotropic plants that allow people to access otherworldly beings, talk with souls, or he even had this idea that is akin to some sort of acoustic levitation, and he says that this is what lifted the granite blocks to create the Great Pyramid of Giza. And while we don't have magic shrooms in One Piece, we have been very recently introduced to the drink the Green Fairy in Elbaf, which I do know also exists in our real world as well and that seems to have some mind altering capabilities and the power of music and in particular the power of the drums that's an idea that we do have via Gear Fifth, via Sun God Nika and maybe that's a stretch to try tie it to the concept of acoustic levitation but who knows maybe you could say that there is a connection there not to mention let's go back to Hancock's other key premise the idea that this ancient civilization survived survived or existed until the last ice age and it was the comets that took them out. Well, it just so happens that the only ancient weapon that we have yet to be introduced to is Uranus and given that Uranus is a sky related deity, it's even possible that Uranus is going to be somehow related to comets or meteors and maybe it was Uranus that sunk the world underwater or comet blasts, meteor blasts that caused this great seismic activity that caused the rest of the world to sink underwater. Anyways, I just found my deep dive into Atlantis very, very insightful, very, very interesting. And I'm super glad that I finally got around to it and I'm able to share it with you all because it does seem like, as with everything else, Oda has taken inspiration from at least some of these ideas, which is obviously not to say that everything is going to be one for one. Oda obviously takes inspirations from many things, as I keep saying. In fact, I have discussed many other key real-life influences that we can see in One Piece, and I'd recommend you to go watch these videos. But before you go on to watch these, let me know what you think about the story of Atlantis, how it may relate to One Piece. If you enjoyed today's discussion, please make sure to subscribe to the channel. You can also like and share the video, and if you want to support the channel even further, you can even become a Patreon member like these wonderful, wonderful people. But as always, thank you so much for listening to another one of my ramblings. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.